Right, can I welcome you back? I hope you're all sitting comfortably. Um, we have now, I'm afraid, a very limited time to engage in what I consider to be one of the most important functions of this tribunal, way the way forward. Because one of the lines in the film that I saw at lunchtime which is so devastating, the actual effect of what's going on, and I'm going to have to cut short what I was going to say, unusually because uh, there isn't the time to say it all. But there was a very poignant sentence by one of the people being bombed out of his home. He said, there is no law to protect us. There is no law to protect us. Now, as a lawyer sitting there watching it, once again, one gets exercised, one gets upset, one gets angry, yes. And the moment that you aren't in that field, then you're not a human being. So yes, I'm angry. I'm angry because the real kernel of all this, which you've been listening to now for two days, and if you didn't know before you came, I'm sure you do by now, we all know what the problem is. We all know what the violations are. The Russell Tribunal has been identifying those in the last three hearings. And both the reports are available, and I suggest that they are read. Because we've had findings in relation to the violations, and there are a myriad of them. And they cover the violations. They are covered by an international framework of law that's there already. Now, I would like to emphasize, and I'm sorry to have to do it, this is not a symposium. It's a very important distinction. This is a tribunal attempting to exercise itself as a tribunal would, which means occasionally there are some unpalatable questions that are asked both ways. It's not a symposium in which it's just a debate and you make a speech. So I, I, I'm keen to emphasize that's how we operate. But the reports have said, not only with their findings, they've had a part of the report which addresses this topic. Now, we've never had it as a separate session, the way forward. We've asked witnesses as we go along how you would deal with the situation. And in each report, there's a section that deals with the way forward. Recommendations. Now, the recommendations are important. In other words, we don't come to this fresh today. We have thought about it before, but we want to think about it now in the context of the US and the United Nations. As Stefan Hessel said at the beginning, we're here in to ensure that the job that should be done by the United Nations, the General Assembly, the Security Council, the ICC, the ICJ, is done. And we have to remember where we're coming from. Our authority stems from civil society, civic international society. That's our authority. We're here representing, if we can, the conscience of the world about an issue that is international. We've seen how its repercussions can be seen in lots of other states, countries, peoples, communities. So that's the obligation that has not been carried out. That's the obligation that we want to do. And I just want to put it in this other context. You know, we're not sitting here as though nothing else is happening in the world. We're actually at a very crucial watershed. There is an economic crisis which is affecting every corner of the world. There is a debacle that is just an inch or so away. So one has to remember that the bases of power are being threatened economically as we speak. That's the first point. Second point, people throughout the world are recognizing that this opportunity to, as it were, retake the streets is happening which is why we are in a strong position to do exactly the same. You've seen it in various countries where regimes have fallen. But somebody down here had a, a banner on a computer screen here. The Occupy movement is the other one which has, de oh, there he is, has demonstrated very clearly the power of people 
collectively standing in solidarity. And that's really why we're here, is the solidarity of the legal framework that we've got. And I finish on this note because I know Angela wants to say something as well briefly. And the reason why I'm exercised about the term apartheid, which has a definition which is not locked into South Africa. The reason I'm anxious about this is, after the last hearing, we, were, we made a recommendation that a UN body consider this term. John Dugard wrote a very informed paper on the back of what we did in South Africa. And I did the oral argument in front of an 18 delegate committee in Geneva. Along with a number of other NGOs that are here today, for the first time, it's been referred to, first time, it's taken all this time just to get a UN body to embrace that term in relation to Israel. It's the one term they don't wish to, ex to acknowledge. It's the one term they've denied year after year after year. Having got, made that achievement, which you can read about, we have now to progress that. It's all staged, of course but is to get that term acknowledged by the United Nations, and of course we go to the United Nations tomorrow. So my anxiety after seeing the film and before seeing the film is, it's action now. We need plans for the future. I'm not saying one shouldn't consider other terms, other, but at the moment we have enough on our plate to be going on with. Angela. Well, first of all, it's... Um it's really an honor to be able to co-chair this last session of uh, the Russell uh, Tribunal that is entitled Ways Forward. And I want to emphasize that uh, uh, um, the uh, formulation is in the plural, uh, Ways Forward. I would like to, I would like to um, once again bring to our attention the fact that <coughs> many people who might have participated in these deliberations have been refused uh, 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 visas, and therefore many Palestinians and others who were engaged in on-the-ground work inside Palestine and in other parts of the world have been uh, denied entrance into the U.S. So let's keep this in mind as we uh, uh, move forward to uh, talk about uh, how we might translate uh, 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 some of the um, um, many um, amazing analyses we've heard over the last two days. And it, it's only been two days. It seems like it's uh, been uh, much longer than that, doesn't it? Uh, but we have now reached the point where we have to talk about uh, strategies uh, for resistance. And in this context, I would like uh, to ask uh, uh, Phyllis uh, Bennis, who is going to address us on US civil society and international NGOs to come forward. Thank you, Phyllis. Thank you all for managing to stay with it for these two days. I'd like to thank the Russell Tribunal for inviting me to participate and especially thank the jurors and the jurors of public opinion, those who are watching around the world, because this isn't only about the hundreds of people that are here in this room. It's not only about these eminent jurors. This is ultimately about what we do with what we learn and what we say and what we take away from here, as is the case with all of international law. It's the case of Richard Falks and John Dugard's brilliant reports as the Special Rapporteurs on Human Rights in the Occupied Palestinian Territory, one of those titles you can barely get out without <coughs> mumbling it because they're only important if we hold them up as tools in building a movement. And what I want to talk about is that question of building a movement. You know, as devastating as the situation is right now in Palestine, and it is getting worse, as we've heard, it's not getting better, it is getting worse. And in so many parts of the world, including here in the wealthiest country of the world, that is somehow pretending it's broke, there is, a sense, there is a sense that things are getting more desperate. But in that context, 
I think there are few, if any, movements that are moving forward, that are growing, and that are seeing results at the level of solidarity and transforming political discourse as much as the movement against Israeli occupation and Israeli apartheid. And that is something that we should be very, very proud of. The challenge that we face, and it is a huge one, is how to transform the, the, the transformation of discourse into a transformation of policy. And this is the challenge we face in the movement against the war in Iraq, against the movement for the movement of, against the war in Afghanistan, the movement against the drone war, the movements that are rising in response to the economic crisis. In every case, we have transformed the discourse away from the deficit and to focus on inequality. Winning massive majorities to be against the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and increasingly against the drone wars, but without changing policy because our so-called democracy is so broken that public opinion means very little in changing policy. That is the challenge we face. So when we look at the combination of United States and UN power, and when we look at the absence of Raji Sirani and Leila Shahid, who should be here, and it is the US State Department that we should be very clear is responsible for them not being here. Let us have no illusions of why they are not here. We are reminded of the impact of the history, the legacy of US domination of the United Nations that so often has rebuffed requests, demands, by the United Nations itself. Some of you will remember in 1988 when Yasser Arafat, the leader of the PLO at the time, was invited by the General Assembly to come to address the assembly, to speak to the people of the world in the context of the mobilization of the first intifada. And the answer of the, quote, host country was, sorry, he's not welcome here. And the entire UN General Assembly, with its security guards and its translators, and at a cost of hundreds of millions, sorry, hundreds of thousands of dollars, packed up and decamped to Geneva for 24 hours to hear a 20-minute speech. Really? Yeah. I mean, this is what US domination of the United Nations looks like. But we have another model. You know, when we look at the history of the United States, we see the history, the legacy of genocide, of slavery, of disempowerment. But parallel to that, we see another history. The history that the great historian Howard Zinn taught us in the people's history of the United States. That there is a people's history, a history of resistance, right from the beginning. So just as we see a history of UN domination of the United Nations, we see another history of civil society, social movements, joining with governments that for their own opportunist reasons are doing the right thing on the rare occasion, forcing the UN to do the right thing and do what its charter says, stand against the scourge of war, stand against empire. It doesn't happen very often, but I want to tell you the story of one time when it did, because I think it gives us a model of what that kind of mobilization can look like. And that is in the run-up to the war in Iraq, when the US and the UK were desperately trying to get UN approval, UN endorsement, to make an illegal, illegitimate war at least legal. It would still be illegitimate, but at least it would be legal if they could just get those votes in the Security Council. And you remember what happened. The Security Council was divided. And the so-called uncommitted six, six poor, impoverished, quite dependent countries of the global south. Guinea, Cameroon, I'm seeing if I can remember them. Guinea, Cameroon, Angola, Chile, Pakistan, Mexico. Got it. They stood fast and they said no. Now these are not countries any one of which could have gone head to head by themselves. But together, when faced with the rest of the world facing mobilizations that culminated on February 15th 2003, almost 10 years ago, 10 years ago next February, when almost 14 million people on one singular day marched in the streets saying the world says no to war in 50 different languages. Those countries stood defiant of US pressure and forced the United Nations Security Council to refuse 
and to stand with the people of the world who were saying no to war. And on that day, that morning, a small group of us, it was Harry Belafonte and Archbishop Desmond Tutu, we went to see Kofi Annan, who was then the Secretary General of the United States. No, United Nations. The, sorry, oh my God. I am so sorry. I am so sorry. I am sorry to Kofi more than anyone else. <laughs> I never thought I would be apologizing. We went to visit the Secretary General of the United Nations. And Bishop Tutu began looking at the Secretary General across the table and he said, we are here on behalf of the people who are marching in 665 cities all around the world. And we're here to tell you that those people marching in those 665 cities, we claim the United Nations as our own. We claim it in the name of the global movement for peace. It was an amazing moment. It was an amazing moment because it was that moment of reclaiming what the United Nations was supposed to be. Remember, the UN Charter doesn't begin with the words, we the governments of the 50 most powerful white nations in the world, as the UN was founded. It begins, we the peoples of these United Nations. And that's what we are fighting to reclaim. That's what we're fighting to reclaim. So we know it didn't stop the war, but it did ensure that that illegitimate war was also understood to be illegal. And that's huge, because it turns out that around the world, people care about international law. And unlike our governments, people don't want to live in rogue states that routinely violate international law. So when we look at what has to happen in the United States to change our policy, we begin with the need to change that discourse. And that is where we have had amazing <coughs> successes. Let me give you just a few examples, and they are numerous. Just a couple of weeks ago, the Democratic Party, hardly a bastion of support for Palestinian rights, held its meeting to figure out its political party. And at that meeting, someone had managed to delete from the draft the language that said the United States must, must move its embassy to Jerusalem something that is completely in contradiction of international law and which no other country in the world has done. There used to be two, now there's none. And everybody knows it's not gonna happen, but it's a big deal in terms of you know, political discourse, making the lobby happy, et cetera, et cetera. Somebody had managed to remove the language. There was panic on the stage when they realized, oh my God, they've been, it's been removed. We're putting it back in. And they had to have a vote. This is a democracy, right? So they had a vote. It took three votes of the crowd with shouts of no that were so much louder than the shouts of yes. It took them three times before even that moderator, who was so desperate to change it, had the nerve to say, okay, now I find that it was a two-thirds majority. Really? Yeah. So that's one example. A week ago in the New York Times, an article on Iran, again, accepting all of the usual assumptions of Israeli danger by Iran, et cetera, et cetera, in the middle of an article, there's a reference to Israel's still unacknowledged nuclear weapons arsenal. Whoa. Now, those of you who are not from the United States would say, why is that an issue? Of course there's an unacknowledged nuclear weapons arsenal. The whole world knows that. Yeah, but in the United States, our mainstream media and our government, more importantly, doesn't acknowledge it. We accept, they accept, the Israeli notion of strategic ambiguity as to whether or not they have. No, that's their term. Come on, I didn't make it up. So that's another example. In 2010, when we heard that there was a lot of pressure from the United States against Israel. Now, in fact, there was no pressure on settlements, as we know. But we were being told there was a lot of pressure. Obama is throwing Israel under the bus. Oh my God, what are we going to do? Lots of pressure. There was a poll asking people their view of Israeli settlements. And choice number one said, Israelis are building settlements in the occupied territories for, for security reasons, and they have the right to build wherever they want. Sentence number two, Israelis are building settlements on expropriated Palestinian land. They should be torn down and the land returned to its original owners. Now, that happens to be accurate, but it's a very provocative way of describing it. 63% of registered Democrats chose sentence number two. That's huge. We don't acknowledge those victories. They have happened because there is a movement 
demanding an end to the $4.1 billion of US military aid to Israel, imposing BDS requirements. What does that mean in the context of the United States? Well, it means boycotting individual actions, boycotting goods that either support Israeli occupation in the occupied territories, or that support the Israeli militarization overall. Lots of different definitions. It means institutions in the United States facing divestment claims when their money is being used, the profits of that money is being used to support occupation and apartheid. And where are we seeing this? The churches. The churches are way out in front of the left and the students and all the rest of us right now on the question of divestment. We have mainstream US churches, the Methodists, the Presbyterians, the Quakers. The Quakers are kind of mainstream on this one because they were late. The, the, the Presbyterians and the Methodists were way out in front of the Quakes. I don't know what happened this time. But they all now have voted for strong boycott resolutions. They have all voted for strong uh, resolutions against US military aid. And they have all come very, very close, it'll probably happen the next round, to voting for full divestment. So this is the focus on corporations, US corporations and corporate policy in this country, as well as the government policy of complete defense of Israel in the United Nations. And this is where the question of the US and the UN come together. Part of it is about the veto, and we've heard a lot about the veto. We heard how 75% of the US vetoes cast in the last, I think it's 20 years, I recommend people to see my colleague David Wildman's incredible article on the veto. I think it's something like 75% of all US vetoes of the last 20 years have been cast to defend <coughs> apartheid, either in South Africa or Namibia or Israel. That's a huge, horrifying record for a country like ours that claims to be against apartheid. But it's not only about the veto, because it's not only about the, the Security Council. Despite the fact that the UN General Assembly is by far the most democratic operation, the most democratic agency within the United Nations, one country, one vote. Now granted, when you have China and India each have one vote and Vanuatu and the Micronesian islands each have one vote, it's not exactly democratic. But in the context of states, we'll give them some credit, it's the, the closest thing to a UN democracy we've got. In the context of, of the UN General Assembly, we see a massive campaign that works all too often to intimidate, threaten, punish countries for their votes where they don't have a veto. So one example, again, using the example of the run-up to the war in Iraq, there was a memorandum circulated by the US, uh, the US mission to the UN to every member country of the United Nations General Assembly that said, and I don't remember the exact language, but the gist of it was, there is a move afoot to have another discussion of the situation in Iraq in the General Assembly. We do not believe that that will be a helpful thing to happen. Please note, that was the language, please note that this issue and your position on it is very important to us. Now, you want to take that as a threat? You know, what about your foreign aid? What about whatever? Remember the Yemen precedent of the first Gulf War in 1990 when the US was trying to get a Security Council resolution passed, endorsing, and th at that time, George Bush Sr. succeeded to get a resolution endorsing another war in the Middle East. Two countries voted no. Cuba voted no on principle. Yemen, recently reunified, the only Arab country on the Security Council, could not afford to vote to support a US invasion of another Arab country. Yemen voted no. And no sooner had Abdullah al ashtal put down his hand, there was the US ambassador at his side saying, that will be the most expensive no vote you ever cast. <laughs> And sure enough, three days later, the US cut its entire aid budget to Yemen, poorest country in the Arab world. Now at the time, nobody really cared about Yemen, so they didn't bother to worry that he was caught on an open microphone saying that, and it was soon broadcast around the world, because the issue wasn't really Yemen. It was the message to the rest of the world, particularly to the global south, particularly to those countries newly decolonized who might have the chutzpah to stand up to the United States and say, you know what? Independence means something to us, and we're going to use it. So the question becomes, what do we do to reclaim the United Nations, to reclaim the kind of movement we saw 
on February 15th of 2003, to remind ourselves of what Bishop Tutu's words to Kofi Annan mean. I don't think it necessarily means that we can realistically plan for street demonstrations that are going to bring 14 million people out into the streets. That may happen, hopefully sooner rather than later, but I don't think that's necessarily the only kind of campaign we can work on. The BDS campaign as a global campaign has played that role of uniting movements across the world, recognizing that while conditions are different in every country and therefore targets are different in every country, some countries are going to focus on sanctions, some on boycotts, some on divestment, some on goods produced only in the occupied territories, others on goods produced anywhere in Israel. Many definitions. It's a broad tent movement, and it has succeeded and is succeeding at bringing together people around the world to say we take a lesson from the particular anti-apartheid movement that focused on South African apartheid. Israeli apartheid is different, but they are both in violation of the international covenant against the crime of apartheid. And we uphold that covenant as the basis for the campaign of BDS. BDS isn't because we like Palestine and we don't like Israel. Yay to Palestinians and boo to bad Israel. It's about saying yes to international law and human rights. So it says we will impose sanctions we will run campaigns of divestment or boycotts until Israel stops violating international law. Not forever because we don't like them, because we want to make the 23rd wealthiest country in the world poor, but because they're violating international law, and at least in this country, our tax money to the tune of $4.1 billion just this year is going to pay for it. That's what we are facing. Diplomats around the world recognize the importance of a UN role in the Palestinian diplomacy. President Lula's speech to the General Assembly in 2006, I don't know how many of you remember it, it was one of those astonishing moments. You know, it's one of those weird things at the UN that no one knows why it happens, but Brazil gets the first speech after the Secretary General every year. I don't know why, but they do. President Lula gets up 2006, and he's giving a good speech, but basically a fairly routine speech about Brazil's uh, policies and priorities for the coming year in the international arena. And suddenly, in the middle of nothing, he says, we should be very clear that the major powers have controlled the diplomacy around the Israel-Palestine conflict for 21 years, and for that, well, he didn't say 21 years, he said whatever it was, 18 years. And for that many years, they have failed. Isn't it time, he said, for the smaller countries of the world to pick that up and make it their own and build a diplomacy based at the United Nations? And people watching it were saying, whoa, is he serious? And it turned out his diplomats, his defenders were all saying, yes, he's serious. We didn't do enough of a good job that time around. We need to be the ones that are mobilizing immediately in Brazil, around Brazil, and in the rest of the world to say, okay, what are we gonna to do to make that real? What are we gonna to do to make that happen? Because what we're seeing, we've heard such important news about the good work that some UN agencies, for example, OCHA, UNRWA, et cetera, are doing in the occupied territories and in the refugee camps in the surrounding states. But those agencies, even those agencies, are being undermined by the lack of credibility of the United Nations because of the role that it is playing politically in the rest of the world. So when the UN gives in and joins the quartet, that decision undermines the ability of UNRWA to do its work. It undermines the ability of OCHA to do its work. It undermines the mission of the United Nations overall. We have to use the United Nations to coordinate our civil society activism. The International Coordinating Network on Palestine, which is made up of several hundred organizations from all over the world, accredited to the Division for Palestinian Rights, which is the secretariat arm of the General Assembly Committee that has the best name in all of the UN. See if you can stick with me on this one. The Committee for the Exercise of the Inalienable Rights of the Palestinian People. The SIRP. That important committee, the name, the importance of it belied by my making fun of the name, is a very important committee which doesn't get a whole lot of attention, but it is 
to that committee that organizations can be accredited and we can use that accreditation to bring together organizations around the world who are doing their work in support of Palestinian rights in the context of international law and human rights. When civil society recognizes that our job is to take up the slack for the failures of 21 years of US-backed diplomacy, we don't need to start that again. I was recently going head to head with a top uh, White House official, and he said, you'll all be glad to know that, the, that, that we're very close to being able to announce that the bilateral peace talks are about to, announce, to be announced again. And there was silence in the room. I knew he was expecting applause. There was silence because 21 years of failed diplomacy doesn't mean that we want to go to 22. It means we need different diplomacy, not more of the same. And that diplomacy needs to be led by the United Nations. Our job as civil society is to pick up the slack when the United Nations fails to do the job it is mandated to do because the United States government refuses to allow it to do what it is mandated to do. That's our job. That's the job of civil society. That was the reason that the largest of the United States mobilizations on February 15, 2003, and there were 250 some odd demonstrations across this country, but by far the largest was at the foot of the United Nations. Because we were saying to the United Nations the same thing that people around the world were saying, the world says no to war. Well now, the world is saying no to Israeli occupation and apartheid. And some of us are saying it in the streets, and some of us are saying it in the halls of Congress, and some of us are saying it in corporate boardrooms, and some more of us are saying it outside those corporate board meetings. And all of that work is coming together to create the kind of mass movement that is the only strategic answer to those failures of US-led diplomacy, of US domination of the United Nations, we need to reclaim the United Nations. We need to remember Bishop Tutu's words that we are reclaiming the United Nations in the name of those who stand for human rights, for justice, for Palestinians, and for everyone else. Thank you. Well, first of all, let me thank Phyllis uh, Bennis for the powerful presentation. And uh, you should know that she is the director of the New Internationalism Project at the Institute for Policy Studies, and among um, uh, many other things, is on the steering committee of the United States campaign to end is the Israeli occupation. And I see that Stefan has a question. Well, I cannot do less but to recall what has happened in order to get the United Nations to exist. I was young at that time. I'm no longer. But I still remember You're young to that, us. that it was President Franklin Delano Roosevelt who made it possible for the victors of World War II to get together, to draft a charter, a charter that is still alive, that is still the basic document for all nations, the 193 nations who are, not part, who are now part of that organization. Had it not been for the strength at that time of the United States' basic values of democracy, to prevail over the resistance of the colonial powers of all sorts of backward-looking people, that was achieved. And in that charter, there is an Article 71, very important, which says that non-governmental organizations should be asked to be consulted on what is happening to the peoples and not only to the governments. We have been living with a triangle working the wrong way, triangle composed of the financial and economic forces, of the governments subservient to those forces, and of the people unable yet, but only yet, 
uh, to make their voices really known. As you probably know, I've had the tremendous uh, advantage, privilege, of producing a little 30-page book which we call Time for Outrage. In this little book, which I printed when I thought it would have 8,000 copies, has now over 3 million copies and has been translated into 35 languages, including the people of Esperanto, who <laughs> told me, we want to translate it in Esperanto, then everybody in the world will be <laughs> able to read it. I'm not absolutely sure that that is going to happen. But I am not standing alone. In that little book, it is made quite clear that the situation in Palestine, it's the only international situation that we spoke about, and that is unacceptable and must be changed by the kind of public effort that our marvelous speaker has just been uh, relating to. That movement exists. We have people here with us who have been working on it and can, can continue to work. It must be said that during the past six or nine months, real progress has been made in that direction. People within the United Nations, people within UNESCO, have been making a great effort to bring this terrible problem to a better understanding, to a knowledge of how it can be handled, and Michael Mansfield was quite right in telling us it can be handled now because we have the international effort on apartheid, so we are no longer powerless. But in order to become powerful, the movement, perhaps the most important, is to make a worldwide claim that there is something that can no longer be withheld and that must go forward now. And I'm so grateful to you for having told us that even here in this country, which has so many reasons to be held backward, next election, God knows what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, we need you because you're still a leading and great people in spite of whatever government you may put <laughs> in the place. Thank you. Let me just say one thing, which is thank you for your lifetime of work. And I'm so glad that you remain so young to remain with us. <laughs> Are there any questions? Um, OK, I have. I have uh, uh, one question. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about um, the um, success of the anti-apartheid movement, and particularly of uh, the boycott, divestment, and sanctions campaign in connection with the campaign against South African apartheid. And I, um, I remember that when the boycott against Shell Oil was announced, it was taken up uh, almost immediately all over the world. And I'm wondering whether you think that um, together with focusing on um, all products uh, uh, manufactured in Israel and uh, focusing on corporations that have relations uh, with is Israeli corporations, that if we might come up with a targeted boycott that might help to uh, enable a more massive organizing effort. Thanks, Angela. I think that's a very important question. I think that strategically, it's always more important to have many forces in many different countries focused on one target. It's, it's much stronger than having lots of smaller campaigns. Some of that is beginning to emerge. The campaign against Veolia, for instance, which began in Europe, it's a company not as well known here I was in the thinking United of States. Veolia as a matter of yeah, fact. Yeah, Veolia is very well known in, in Europe. It's been targeted because of its role in building the light rail system 
uh, across Jerusalem and into the West Bank that denies, it's, it's an apartheid rail system. Uh, it's not as well known as a company in the United States, although it recently has purchased a number of very well known US companies. So it's mm -hmm. becoming a bigger part of the BDS work in the US. In the US campaign to end the Israeli occupation, we have worked on uh, boycotts and divestment campaigns even before the actual call from Palestinian civil society, beginning with Caterpillar after the killing of Rachel Corey back in 2003. Caterpillar has remained a, a, a centerpiece of this targeting. But I think that the importance remains of having very focused uh, uh, targets. I think the comparison is important in one other way. When we look at the anti-apartheid movement and particularly the later stage of the Free South Africa movement and the, the banking boycotts, it was part of a global strategy called for by the leadership of the South African liberation movement. The ANC had essentially a three-part strategy, one part of which was a global solidarity campaign. With Palestine, there has not been that same kind of call in the context of a clear strategy. There has been, the, the, in some ways, the equivalent with the Palestinian civil society call for a BDS campaign globally. It's not tied specifically to a political settlement. It very specifically does not take up the numbers of states, you know, uh, the one state, two state question. It doesn't take up a number of other things. It's focused very clearly around international law. It's designed to force an end using nonviolent economic pressure to force an end to Israeli occupation, it's Israeli apartheid, and it's violations of three sets of international laws. So it's very specific in that way. Um, but I think it is an important lesson for all of us to learn from the South Africa movement that part of its success, and we should remember that it was 40, more than 40 years, the, the boycott was first called for in 1959. I don't propose that we should have to wait that long for Palestine, but we should also recognize how far we've come in a relatively much shorter time, but that that is part of a broader global strategy. One more question, I think uh, Dennis has Actually, a question. Actually, it's, uh, it's more of a, of a comment uh, uh, that um, the, uh, I'm sorry we weren't, we weren't able to have Russell Means here, uh, and I'm sorry that the the uh, television didn't work out well. But um, I was notified that, Russ, that Russ's brother, Bill Means, also uh, one of the national officers of the American Indian Movement, uh, has submitted and did submit uh, a position paper with pa on, on Palestine uh, back in, and submitted it in 1980 uh, at, in um, Geneva. The International Indian Treaty Council has NGO status with the UN, and they hopefully will be able to read uh, the information uh, on on the position paper that we wrote uh, for on Palestine. So, in Brussels, I hope we'll be able to put it together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>